Hello, my name is David Golub. I'm a platform architect with Microsoft. We're going to look at uh, Always On in the SQL 2012 platform. A uh, specific uh, focus will be on availability groups. Uh, in today's webcast, we'll cover uh, a number of the aspects of Always On availability groups. Um, hopefully, this is uh, educational for you. So. Uh, to start, I'm going to show you the environment that I have set up. Uh, I'm in uh, Failover Cluster Manager, and I've clicked on Nodes, and you can see there are three nodes. Uh, these are uh, uh, virtual machines in my environment. One node called AG Auto Failover, AG Primary, and AG Read Only. So those are the uh, server names that uh, have their associated uh, DNS entries and uh, respective IP addresses. So th those are the three nodes that are in my, in my uh, uh, Windows failover cluster. Uh, I am currently on the AG primary node. Uh, expanding the services, uh, you can see that uh, there is a service SLG AG, and that's the name of an availability group that I configure. Uh, the services, uh, in my case, represent a, uh, an AG, an Availability Group Listener. I name mine SLG AG, and um, I really should have named that SLG AG Listener, something that's a bit more uh, descriptive, <laughs> indicating that it's a listener. And then there's uh, also just the Availability Group itself that uh, is uh, being managed by uh, cluster, uh, uh, cluster services uh, checking on the, the health of the, uh, of the availability group. And I'll talk a bit more about that. What does, what does health mean and what are failover conditions? We'll talk a bit more about that in, in, a, um, in a little while here. So uh, we have three nodes in our cluster. And on each of those nodes, you will find uh, one SQL Server instance. So each node has one SQL Server instance. And I happen to have uh, conveniently named the SQL instances uh, with the same name of the, uh, of the server node. So the SQL Server instance AG primary uh, lives on the node AG primary. AG auto failover lives on the node AG auto failover, and then AG read only lives on the node AG read only. Uh, again, uh, these may not be the, the best naming standards because it can get a little confusing, uh, but for purposes of our demonstration, I thought it, uh, I thought it would make sense so that you uh, know what instance you're looking at and what uh, node that SQL instance is uh, lives on. So I'm going to expand AG primary and down here you'll see a folder always on high availability and I'll expand always on high availability and uh, you can see that there's one availability group that's been defined SLG AG and if I expand SLG AG you can see that it contains replicas. It contains what are the databases that make up this SLG AG availability group. And uh, are there any availability group listeners that have been defined? In our case, there is, if you recall. So I'll expand the availability group uh, replicas. And you can see for the availability group SLG AG, we have three replicas um, and those replicas these are really SQL Server named instances uh, AG auto failover SQL instance is participating uh, and managing replicas of the database within the SLG AG availability group uh, AG primary is a named instance a SQL instance that is participating and then the SQL instance AG read only is also uh, participating. And sure enough, those are the respective uh, 
um, those named instances uh, live on those respective cluster nodes as well. A replica needs to be uh, uh, a SQL instance in a separate node from the other SQL instances, and that's the case in, in, uh, in our configuration. And you can see the status. Right now, the SQL Server instance AG primary is the, uh, is the primary uh, instance, the primary replica, where uh, the transactions are being streamed to AG auto failover and AG read only. Transactions from what? Well, transactions from the databases that we have added to this availability group. Let's expand availability databases and you can see the databases that are within the SLG AG availability group are report server, report server tempdb, and then some other extraneous database called SLG simple db. So as you might imagine, uh, I have reporting services configured. Um, it's actually, in my case, on a separate node entirely. It's completely not following the best practice because the report server I installed on my domain controller. And when I con uh, configured reporting services, uh, it asked, which server uh, would you like me to put my uh, reporting services databases and I indicated SLG AG. I indicated the availability group listener and from reporting services perspective it just looked like any named SQL instance um, and uh, it, uh, it then created the database initially on the primary but because this plumbing was in place uh, it also then created a replica on the other instances. Just to show you, if I expand AG Auto Failover and Databases, you can see Report Server, Report Server TempDB, and SLG Simple DB is out there. If I expand AG Read Only, similarly, you can see Report Server, Report Server TempDB, and SLG Simple DB is out there on that SQL named instance as well. So that plumbing and uh, that, uh, uh, those replicas being set up, uh, the reporting services configuration didn't know anything about it. Um, and as we continue here, if I uh, come over here to SLG AG primary, the availability group, I right click and if I look at properties, uh, we can see down here that here are, the here are the databases that are within that availability group and uh, here are the replicas and you can see that AG auto failover is the role secondary. The transactions are managed synchronously um, and auto failover is automatic. In other words, the AG auto failover is an automatic failover target. Uh, it's a readable secondary, and uh, and then we have some other configurations that represent session timeout, uh, the HTTP endpoint for which uh, um, the uh, AG auto failover is communicated over for streaming those transactions. The AG primary, the role is primary. Um, its availability mode is also synchronous. Um, it's also a failover target. So if we were to fail over, we would automatically fail over to AG auto failover, that SQL named instance. And if we then were to uh, fail over again, if AG auto failover became our primary, we would fail right back to AG primary. And then AG read only, uh, it is availability mode asynchronous so that means the transactions are flowing asynchronously to AG read only and by definition that means it has to be manual failover you cannot do an automatic failover to a asynchronous availability mode uh, um, 
SQL Server, and its readable secondary is marked as read intent only. And these will all uh, make more sense in a, in a minute. So that's how we've configured these. So considering that, uh, when you look at AG primary, and then we come down here to AG auto failover, notice that the report server and the report server temp DB and the SLG simple DB, there are, they are all in the state synchronized. And if we come down here to AG read only, notice the state is synchronizing. And why is, uh, why, why is the state different for auto failover and read only? Well, auto failover is marked as synchronous transaction commit. So uh, synchronized simply means that we know that when a transaction was committed uh, to, uh, to the primary, that it was also committed to the AG auto failover, so we can mark the state as synchronized. Synchronizing is simply implying that, hey, transactions are streaming to read only, but it's kind of fire and forget. So uh, that's because we've marked it as asynchronous, if you just saw. You would use uh, that, uh, that status uh, for a disaster recovery configuration. So uh, AG read only, this particular instance, this SQL instance, this could be living 500 miles away. And as a result, uh, living 500 miles away, we can't, uh, uh, we, we perhaps can't uh, guarantee, uh, nor do we want to uh, um, incur a potential performance penalty by, by indicating synchronized. Uh, the, the network may not be as reliable, it might be slower, so we, we, don't, we, we probably don't want to mark that as, uh, a, synchro as a, a synchronous transaction state. We want to mark it as asynchronous so that uh, the transactions can flow. But you know what? We're going to do our best uh, to keep it synchronized, but there could be data loss, uh, hence uh, synchronizing. So that's our, our uh, configuration. And if we launch uh, once again, uh, Cluster Manager, you can see the status of Availability Group SLG AG. It says Current Owner is AG Primary. So now let's just do a little test here. I'm going to come back here to AG Primary. And I'm going to stop the service for that SQL Server named instance. Um, you probably, hopefully, have a sense of what will occur. And I'll take the mystery out by launching the uh, failover cluster manager. And if you can see, you can see the current owner is AG primary. Uh, we can see that cluster services did pick up that the um, the primary is down, and what we should see is uh, some status changes. Let's do a little refresh here. So now you can see that the uh, status of SLG AG availability group, the current owner, is AG uh, auto failover. And you can see that the AG primary SQL instance is down, so the auto failover, uh, the auto failover worked, and then of course uh, we can also do a failover using the dashboard. You might use this technique if you were doing rolling upgrades or something, uh, something in that nature, uh, or if for any other reason you needed to uh, manually fail over an availability group. So I'm on the auto failover named instance. Uh, Right-click the availability group, show dashboard, and start failover wizard. And in this case, we'll fail over to AG primary. And we can see the dashboard is taking stock on this state change and reporting in uh, the status. 
and now we can see that SLG AG uh, availability group is in the primary state as we would expect after that auto fail over exercise and the dashboard shows a status that's also consistent with what we would expect. Further, if we go to the failover cluster manager, you can see that the current owner is AG primary. So uh, I showed uh, both a uh, bringing the named instance down and you saw the auto failover and then just I showed you the uh, uh, the dashboard which allows you to manually fail over uh, as well. At this point, let's go ahead and create our own availability group. So I'll come over here to the AG primary uh, SQL Server instance and we'll just kind of follow along. So I'll go to the new availability group wizard and click on next and we're going to create an availability group that includes the Alaska uh, Juvie uh, data mart. So we'll just call this AKGV AG. And then I'll click on next. And for the AKGV availability group, uh, I want the Alaska GV Service Smart to be in there. It meets the prerequisites, and by and large, that means has a full backup been taken. We're also going to add uh, this SLG simple. DB2, database number two. And then I'll click on next. And AG primary, initial role of primary. Um, it will be an auto failover target. Notice that when you click auto failover, it automatically clicks synchronous because those two must go together. And we'll make it a readable secondary which is really handy, by the way. Uh, mirroring, database mirroring, if you recall, doesn't allow for this idea of a readable secondary. And in availability groups, you can have multiple readable secondaries. You can have one auto failover, failover target, but multiple readable secondaries. So I'm going to add a replica. And um, to stick with the naming convention, we don't have to, but we're going to uh, our um, uh, our Replica will, one of our replicas will be AG auto failover, and that will be an automatic failover target. And it will also be uh, readable. And we'll add another replica, and that'll be the SQL named instance AG read only. And for AG read only, notice how automatic failover is grayed out because we've already met the maximum number of auto failover targets. Um, and I leave synchronous commit unclicked. Um, that's just uh, to, to uh, illustrate that perhaps that's a readable secondary, but it's also uh, maybe a disaster recovery target. And then I click on read intent only. And uh, we'll talk about what's the difference between yes, readable secondary, and read intent only. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So now I click on uh, yeah, uh, next and uh, we indicate some common uh, UNC, some common uh, file share location where those other named instances can find uh, the backup and there we go. Now the auto failover and the read only, they're applying um, the backups and they're setting uh, AK Juvie, uh, uh, AK Juvie Mart in the appropriate state. So in read only, it should be synchronizing. And on the auto failover named instance, uh, it should be synchronized. And we'll just go check that. So now if I come down here to the auto failover named instance, SQL named instance, and I expand databases, oh, it's still restoring. Notice this the restoring state. So, uh, and then on AG read only, um, 
It's also, uh, you can see AJ, uh, AK Juvie Service Smart is also restoring, but that should uh, very shortly, uh, those should be in the appropriate state very soon. And now you can see that in the auto, uh, AG Auto Failover named instance that uh, the AK Juvie Service Smart is synchronized. And we'll do a little refresh down here. And you can see in the AG Read Only, the AK Juvenile, uh, Juvenile uh, Service Mart is in the synchronizing state, as well as the associated Simple DB, uh, SLG Simple DB2. So all's, uh, all's well. Uh, here is the AK Juvie AG. And again, come over here to the Failover Cluster Manager, and there is the AK Juvie AG. Notice there's no listener. Well, what, is, what does that mean? It will become clear in a moment. But for right now, you can see that the plumbing is in place. Transactions are uh, being applied as appropriate to the respective availability groups hosted on the replicas of AG Auto Failover as well as Read Only. Um, so with that, uh, I am connected to named instance Read Only. Uh, so if we come over here to the named instance auto AG auto failover, and if I expand AK GV service smart, and I do a um, select top 1000 from the fact table that shows the various GV uh, offenses, there is our result set. So there's the top 1000. Um, so uh, essentially showing that uh, it is a readable secondary. And now if I come down here to uh, the read-only named instance that we're connected to, and I expand the AKGV Service Smart, I get an error. The database AKGV Service Smart is not accessible. Well, it's not accessible because it's marked as read intent only. Um, and that is a little nuance that means uh, you cannot read from it unless your connection is tagged with uh, an application intent equal read only. And that's not the case right now in my connection here. So it does not detect that. And it says, sorry, you can't read from this because you're not explicitly marked as uh, read read only as your application intent. Let's make that a little clearer now. Um, I'm going to come over here to AG uh, DC. That's the virtual machine that's my domain controller. And as I already had indicated, this is where I installed reporting services. You don't re install reporting services on domain controller, but this is a demo environment. So this is for educational purposes. Um, so I'm in Report Builder in my uh, Domain Controller VM. I go to View. And from View, let's go ahead and look at the report data. Have a couple uh, data sets here. And I have a data source. And uh, for my data source, I can add a, uh, I can modify the data source. And we will uh, call this simply uh, AG read only. AG read only. So we're pointing at the named instance AG read only. Uh, the catalog is the AKGV service smart and application intent read write. So Let's uh, go ahead and click on Preview. And we can see that we cannot create a connection to data source, data source 1, which is uh, analogous to what I just tried within Management Studio. So let's come back to Design. And this application intent uh, directive within the connection string. Instead of read write, I'm going to change that to 
read only. And now uh, recall that I had set the AG read only replica um, to not readable equals yes, but to read intent. And now that I'm explicitly saying that application intent equals read only, and I click on preview, I'm now looking at the data. And this is handy because it, uh, it means that uh, no one can just connect Management Studio or any other query analyzer tool uh, directly to uh, the Alaska Juvie Service Smart and just start reading from it. You need to explicitly tag your uh, connection string with uh, application intent equals read only. And you can see that what I do, you can see this expression in the text box here uh, where I'm using the server name. I'm printing, printing, I am displaying the server name uh, by executing a query that simply calls uh, select at at server name. As you can see here. So the top of my report, it will indicate uh, what server uh, am I currently connected to when I execute this report. And this will become a little more interesting in a minute. So what did I do? I explicitly established the name of the SQL Server instance. Um, and it is taking advantage of the transaction plumbing that is synchronizing transactions between the primary and its replicas. I never defined an availability group listener. So I can still use the availability group plumbing and cluster services will still take care of failing over availability groups um, based on a failover condition that's associated with those availability groups. Uh, all of that still works, but I'm not getting the benefit of resolving some listener to the current primary. Um, that's, a, that's a tremendous uh, benefit of availability groups as well. So let's take the uh, Alaska Juvie availability group and let's go a step further and define an actual listener. So I'm going to go back to my primary because I'm just doing all my work right now in the the uh, SQL Server primary instance. And, and now uh, for the Alaska Juvie AG, um, I will, nope, I am in the auto failover. Here we go. So for the Alaska Juvie AG, I expand availability group listener, nothing there. Add a listener, and we'll call this AK Juvie listener. And we'll just hang that off of port 1433, establish a static IP address, click on add. Uh, the, the NICs that represent uh, where the network traffic will flow for the uh, always on platform availability groups. Uh, I won't choose the NIC where uh, all of my uh, remote desktop communication is occurring. Um, and configuring and defining and architecting your network interface cards uh, on your hosts and the various clustered nodes, um, there, there certainly is best practices associated with that, as, as, as there are best practices associated with configuring um, the always-on platform and availability groups. And just go to msdn.com and search on uh, always-on best practices or SQL Server 2012 always on and you will find white papers that outline architectural best practices as well as just technical feature and syntax. Everything I'm doing here you can execute outside of the wizard using T-SQL scripts certainly. 
So we'll just define the address, the IP address for our uh, uh, availability group listener, aka GV listener, to 192.168.31.23. And click on OK. Availability groups, certainly you can span multiple subnets. Uh, it's uh, really a flexible and relatively easy um, high availability platform to configure. So there we go. Now we have the AKGV listener configured. Now go over here to the failover cluster manager, and now you can see that there's the AKGV listener as a service that uh, Cluster Services is monitoring. The current owner is AG Primary. Let's go back to our uh, reporting services report, launch the data source, and in this case, instead of explicitly naming uh, the named instance, we're going to put in the, uh, the listener name, AK. GV listener and click OK. And now when I go to preview, um, for those watching this, uh, this webcast, uh, what do you think the server name will uh, display? What server name will display when I render this report? Because I've entered now AKGV listener and who currently, what, uh, what named instance currently owns AKGV Listener? That IP address is being listened to by the uh, SQL Server named instance AG Primary. So that's why we see this server name. Well, what if we wanted Whenever this read-only directive is indicated in our connection string, application intent, what if rather than having uh, the AKGV listener resolve to the current hosting primary, what if instead we wanted to say, hey, since this application is indicating that it's only doing read-only work based on this application intent, then let's offload that workload. Let's put it onto a different replica. Maybe AG Primary is receiving tremendous amounts of transactions, and we don't want these large range queries, these uh, analytics queries, to be uh, incurring uh, shared locks on our transactional system. Rather, we want, uh, and we don't want that, that CPU and RAM and, and that extra workload anywhere near uh, the, uh, the, the server that's hosting the, uh, the, the SQL Server named instance that's, that's taking on all the transactions. We basically want to route this connection to another replica. So let me show you how to do that. We're going to go back to the primary. And I happen to have created a template. If you didn't know about templates, I can come up over here to View. And you can go to a View within your Management Studio, and you can go to the Template Explorer. And then you'll see a whole bunch of templates that have been pre-populated um, by Microsoft that you can look at. You know, there's a, uh, here's a Stored Procedure template. Uh, create store procedure with an output parameter, for example. And there's a template. And look at this template. Uh, you'll see this interesting syntax for these templates where the first, you have these angled brackets, and the first value in the angle brackets is the parameter name, then the data type, and then a default value. So you can make your own templates. You can right-click New Template. And I made a template for creating uh, an always-on read-only routing um, 
list, basically. So if I double click on that, here's our template. And you can see that I have these angle brackets where the parameter name is SLGAG, and then the data type, and then the availability group name. So I'm going to come up here now to query, specify values for templates, and the uh, availability group name for, uh, for our availability group that will be illustrating this read-only routing, it's Alaska Juvie AG, AK Juvie AG. That's the name of the availability group. So click on OK. And now my syntax has all been changed uh, as appropriate. So let's look at what's going on here. These first three alter statements, alter availability group, uh, AKGVAG, and we're saying when AG primary shows up in a read-only routing list and it's in a secondary role, its URL will be as follows. That happens to be the same endpoint that we created uh, in the wizard. But you need this syntax. So resolve AG primary to TCP uh, colon AG primary contoso.com 1433. Um, I indicated the port 1433 for all of these. And uh, that is, uh, that's the endpoint that we will use uh, to communicate uh, with the uh, um, with the named instances. So I did it for AG primary, for AG auto failover, and for AG read only. And you can see, by the way, if I come over here to the AKGV AG and I go to properties, here are the endpoints uh, whereby uh, the transactions flow. Um, and by the way, uh, these transactions, they're compressed, uh, they can be encrypted, but in this case we're using five, uh, port 5022, so explicitly a port to handle this uh, transactional traffic. For our read-only routing, we are connecting to 1433, which is the uh, um, standard port, and in our case this is what we're connecting to uh, any time uh, read-only uh, directive is handed to application intent within the connection string. Okay, so we've associated AG primary, AG auto failover, and AG read-only to these endpoints, port 1433. Now is really the slightly more interesting part. Now we execute three um, uh, alter statements where we're saying, now multi uh, 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 modify the AKGV AG availability group and uh, when AG primary, replica AG primary, is in primary role, then use the following read-only routing list. So what that means is <clears throat> if my application is connecting and I'm connecting to AKGV AG, and that connection string says application intent equals read-only, then the named instance AG primary it will say, oh, I'm in the primary role. You look like you have application intent read only. Then here's my routing list and what I should do for you. Uh, so AG primary will basically tell the application, uh, reroute your connection first to AG read only, and that resolves, that resolves to this, uh, this name and port. If you can't connect to AG read only, then try AG auto failover, which is this fully qualified name and port. And if you can't connect to AG auto failover, then just go ahead and, and I will service the request. If the primary is AG auto failover, first try AG read only again, then try primary, then try me. 
And if the primary role is AG read only, maybe that was a disaster recovery failover, so the AG read only is now the, the primary. Um, first on the routing list, try AG primary, then try auto failover, and then try me. So we'll go ahead and we'll run. You need to run this uh, set of alter statements on the current primary. And the commands have completed successfully because we ran our query from AG primary. So now let's go back to our report. And we'll go back to our data source just to review it. Remember, we're using AKGV listener. And the initial catalog is the AKGV service smart application intent read only. And if you recall, uh, when I ran this last, the server name reported primary. But now that I have my routing list set up, we can run preview. And sure enough, the uh, routing list worked and my reporting workload was uh, offloaded to the, uh, uh, to the AG read only uh, named instance. Now, it's important to, uh, to note what's happening on AG read only. Well, it's, uh, this is an asynchronous, as you recall, this is the asynchronous uh, um, transaction uh, replica. And uh, you still have, there's already the possibility of data loss. And particularly if my, if my read only routing took me to the auto failover replica, which is synchronous, in either case, there is uh, no, uh, no, trans no isolation level magic that's occurring. Uh, we're using the default isolation level, which is read committed, which means that uh, we are incurring uh, shared read locks on the data that we're reading even if those replicas are not uh, the primary, as we were saying, OLTP replica, we're still incurring shared locks. And there's still transactions streaming from the primary to these replicas. So it's important to be uh, mindful of that. So uh, either establishing no lock hints for your queries um, or uh, or explicitly in your application indicating a read uncommitted or a snapshot isolation. Uh, that could be beneficial, particularly in a, in a heavy transaction work, workload where a lot of transactions are streaming to the replicas and uh, you don't want to hold up uh, those transactions from being committed to the replicas, particularly if it were a synchronous replica and the read-only routing was being directed to towards those synchronous replicas uh, because in that case uh, the primary could potentially be held up as it's trying to write its transactions and it's waiting for uh, it's waiting for the commit to occur um, you could then potentially hold up your your primary so uh, these practices are also well documented in msdn.com and in books online and uh, searches uh, msdn. The search is very effective, and you can look for uh, you can look for read-only replica best best practices. There's something else I hadn't I haven't really uh, given much attention to, and it's just when does cluster services fail over? Um, so, first of all, failover cluster services, uh, it, it certainly will fail over if it detects that it's not getting health check responses back from the different nodes. If it's not getting a health check response back from the current primary, for example, and there's an auto failover target, um, it will uh, trigger a failover in that event. Um, and that's just, uh, that's the way failover cluster services has worked with SQL Server 2008 R2 and, and prior for some time. Uh, now, previous to 2012, 
cluster services was using two techniques. One is looks alive, and looks alive simply means that cluster services for each of the nodes that cluster services is managing that have SQL instances in them, um, it is running a, uh, it is just ensuring, can I connect? Can I ping the SQL instance? If yes, then it looks alive. Uh, and that's very frequent. Uh, the less frequent is, uh, is is alive, and in that case, it's looking for a result set coming back from add at server name, select add at server name. That was old school. Uh, in 2012, the always on platform, we are uh, cluster services uh, is running uh, and uh, interrogating results that come back from a stored procedure called SP Server Diagnostics. And uh, SP Server Diagnostics, there is a health check timeout that you can configure um, and an interval through which SP Server, I mean obviously there's going to be defaults, but how often is SP Server Diagnostics executed and what is the time that I wait for results to come back from SP Server Diagnostics? So that's at the Uber cluster level. Um, but then let's assume all of that plumbing is working fine. I'm getting results back from SP Server Diagnostics and everything is good. In SQL Server 2012, there's five failover condition levels. And let me show that to you. Okay, so I'm in msdn.com and I uh, just searched on Alter Availability Group. I might as well take you to the, the, the under the hood, um, what's going on. And when we set up availability groups using the wizard, this is essentially the T-SQL syntax that was executed. But uh, an availability group, in our case, uh, we, we set up AKJUV availability group, AKJUV uh, AG. And um, this is where we uh, add replicas. It's all one very large T-SQL um, uh, syntax. But in here, you can see that we have uh, this uh, failover condition level. The default is three for an availability group, and health check timeout. And I encourage, I encourage you to go uh, read through. If you understand this alter availability group and all of the uh, the syntax, uh, you're uh, you're in great shape because it's all it's all here, all the way to backup preference. So if an automatic backup is occurring. Should the backup prefer one replica over another? Should it stripe its backups? We didn't get into that, but you should note that as well. Hopefully you're taking notes during this, this webcast. Um, now, uh, back to our failover condition level. So uh, there are failover condition levels uh, number from one through five. And as I had said, three is the default. Uh, specifies that an automatic failover should be initiated on critical SQL server internal errors, such as orphan spin locks, uh, write uh, access violations, uh, too much dumping, um, and that, like I said, this is the default behavior. Um, here is the least picky failover condition level, number one, specifies that an automatic failover should be initiated when any of the following occurs the SQL Server service is down. <laughs> so that's an obvious one. Um, now, uh, obviously, uh, two is inclusive of, inclusive of one, and three is inclusive, inclusive of two and one, and so on and so forth. Um, so what is the pickiest? It's condition five, uh, worker thread issues within the instance, uh, uh, unres uh, unsolvable deadlocks, things like, things like this. So why might you have a SQL Server instance that's hosting multiple availability groups? Uh, my, why might you have one availability group set to condition failover condition level one and another one set to five? Well, think of it this way. Uh, some availability groups, 
might have uh, uh, databases within them that you don't see as mission critical. Other availability groups may have databases that are extremely critical to the business. And for, for some unknown reason, per perhaps, that SQL Server instance that's hosting these availability groups uh, starts to incur uh, massive amounts of, uh, of deadlocks. Um, and this is important. SP Server Diagnostics is what is reporting the, uh, the SQL Server health um, that will trigger whether 1 through 5, that will indicate whether 1 through 5 should be triggered. Cluster Services is monitoring the results from SP Server Di Diagnostics and deciding if 1 through 5 has been triggered. <clears throat> Here's an important point. SP Server Diagnostics does not perform health checks at the database level. So it's at the instance level. So if all of the workloads on a given SQL Server instance are uh, creating uh, excessive unsolvable deadlocks or um, some uh, uh, persistent out-of-memory conditions, uh, if that's the case, then uh, those that are marked as 4 or 5, they will fail over, assuming you have auto failover configured for those availability groups, they will fail over to the replica elsewhere. The idea is that the workloads in total were creating this kind of pressure. So by offloading the mission critical availability groups to another replica on another node elsewhere, it relieves some of the pressure on the named instance on, on the SQL Server instance where the issues occurred. So all of the other availability groups now are happier. And uh, the availability groups that, for example, were marked as failover condition 4 and 5, they're happier too because they're now running on another uh, instance, SQL instance on another SQL ser on another uh, uh, server elsewhere. So this is very interesting because we've not only talked about how you can redirect uh, read-only routing to, to uh, carve up your workloads and distribute the load, but we're also talking here about how you can uh, have a SQL Server that's hosting 100 databases, which is not uncommon, and carve up groups of those databases based on their business criticality and then failing them over uh, with more stringent tests uh, around uh, computing resources. So that's that's really intriguing, uh, really intriguing about uh, uh, always on availability groups. To read about always on failover clustered instances, this is what we always used to do in 2008 R2 and, and uh, earlier. And that's just looking at the SQL Server in total, not chunking it up into these availability groups uh, that contain databases. So this particular webcast does not focus on that because uh, I do want to point out that failover clustered instances in the always on platform in SQL 2012, it still uses all of this great plumbing uh, for health check timeout, for failover condition levels and SP server diagnostics. By the way, you can get to the SP server diagnostics information that information is persisted, so you could just, as a DBA, look at that information to understand the health of the system and perform appropriate reports. But back to my point, uh, failover clustered instances still uses this great plumbing, so it's not the same as it used to be. It's, but uh, 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 for the purposes of this webcast, we're all about availability groups, read-only routing. So I, I hope this has been helpful and uh, educational.